Hi, everybody. Welcome to a Will Eisner Week 2021 special event. I want to thank uh, Jean Luen Yang, and I hope I pronounced your name right or close. You to did. It. Thank you, Good. Danny. Uh, for coming as a guest. I also want to thank Dr. Travis Langley, who you can't see, um, but aside from being uh, one of the world's foremost authorities in comics and psychology and has a whole line of books, um, Travis is kind enough to be doing the tech stuff so Gene and I can just be brilliant and not have to worry about if the thing is recording or not or if our voices are, are, are being picked up. So thanks, Travis. Anyway, Gene, thank you for making the time to do this um, and to come and talk about what Will Eisner means to you and, and, uh, and to other people. So let me do a formal introduction here. Uh, Gene Luen Yang. Uh, has written numerous graphic novels that have been critically acclaimed and sold a lot of copies. Uh, those include American Born Chinese, Boxers and Saints, Shadow Hero, and the Secret Coders. In 2016, one of Arthur Genius Grant, and that same year, the Library of Congress named him as its ambassador for young people's literature. These days, Gene's working at DC Comics as a writer of the new Superman comics. And his latest work for DC can be found in the best-selling graphic novel, Superman Smashes the Clan. Thanks, Gene. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you, Danny. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. Oh, it's great to have you. And um, I'll just, I, you know, we, we had a very uh, um, lovely conversation on the phone the other day. And now mm -hmm. we're doing it with pictures. So That's I will... Right. Um, so I guess, uh, let me just start. Um, when did you first encounter uh, Will Eisner and, and his work? I, I first found out about Will Eisner at the library. So at my local library, they had this uh, book. It, it, was, it was titled something like this, something like The Greatest Cartoonist of All Time or Me, The Greatest Cartoonist of America. And, and in there were the usual suspects. You know, there was uh, Jack Kirby and, and Steve Ditko. But then there's also this guy, Will Eisner, that I, I had never heard of up to that point. I was maybe in, I don't know, I want to say junior high or early high school when I found that book. Um, and, and they only had one page. So for every artist, they had a profile and they showed a page of the work. And the page that they showed for Will Eisner just blew me away. It was, it was, it was uh, the octopus walking through, I think it was a police station. But all it showed were these wet footprints. You didn't see the character at all. And, um, and in just one image, I realized he did like a billion different things, you know, like Eisner set up the mood, he set up the character without even showing the character, he set up action, where all you saw were, were footsteps. Um, and, and he did all these really interesting things with sound effects. So I was immediately mesmerized by that. And after that, I started collecting those old kitchen sink reprints of the spirit. Um, right. So I, I have a, a, a chunk of them in a long box somewhere at my parents' house. Oh, cool. Wow. By the way, I did want to mention uh, that the background, um, it's, it's two things. My background, of course, is a still from the Doctor Strange movie, but uh, Steve Ditko, who uh, was the co-creator of Doctor Strange, uh, based uh, Doctor Strange's window on the spirit's window in his headquarters at Wildwood Cemetery. So it's sort of serving a double purpose. And uh, in case anybody was wondering, uh, where you know um, what what opulent uh, setting I, I was in, and uh, it's of course a green screen fake uh, zoom background. Gene is in uh, is in some wonderful place that's all light and and uh, sunshine. Uh, I'm, I'm in my uh, I'm in my daughter's bedroom. <laughs> it's the quietest <laughs> room, and she has one wall that she likes to keep blank. So that's this uh, wall okay. right here. If I were to pan around, which I'm not going to do, you'd see clothes and books and right. all sorts well, of stuff. Well, if I took if I took down the, the fake background, you'd see some embarrassing stuff in my house too. Anyway, <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask you, you met Will once, uh, you told me. Uh, when was that and, and what was that like? Yeah, it, it, was, uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. I have a photo uh, as, as evidence of it. But it, was, it must have been in the late 90s. I was just starting off in comics uh, and I was at a comic book convention. I believe it was the one in San Diego. And I just saw him. I saw him on the floor. He was walking around looking at uh, the art of other artists. Right. So I stopped him. I asked him for a photo. He graciously said yes. I, I mean, I think he pretty much said yes to everybody. You know, he was just that kind of a, a, a guy. And, um, and we took a photo. And I, I still have it. I have it uh, up on my drawing desk. 
Um, I don't mm. think I, I, I gathered up the nerve to ask any other questions besides that photo. You know, I, I think I might, you, I, I must have said something really fanboy and just left. You know, that's appropriate. Why not? You know, yeah. we're, we're all fanboy. <laughs> no matter how long you're in the business, there's always somebody you're a fanboy of or a fangirl of, or you know, there's there's always somebody who you go, ah, I can't believe yeah. I'm meeting. Them. Uh, if you if you by any chance find that photo and scan it, maybe we can you know intercut it in the uh, sure. when we put it together. Sure, I can uh, I can send it to you. That would be great. Thank you. Um, so now you, um, I want to ask: Do you relate to Eisner's life story in terms of his being like you, a child of immigrants? And you also seem to have a similar story to his in that. You know, Will always uh, in his books and just in, in when he talked about his life, talked about being torn between a very practical career choice and cartooning, which perhaps is a less practical career choice. Yeah. And I know uh, you, you had um, an analogous background. Can you talk a little about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I wonder if that's why I was drawn to comics in general. You know, so many of the, the people who kind of established the conventions of the genre were children of immigrants. Many of them were children of Jewish immigrants from Europe, right? And, and that dynamic of, you know, the, the practical with, with what you love, what's in your heart, um, was definitely a part of, of my childhood. So I, I grew up with two immigrant parents. My dad was born in Taiwan. My mom in mainland China, they both eventually made their way to the United States where they were married and where I was born. And my mom, my mom understood a little bit more. My mom was always interested in the arts. So she was always pretty encouraging with my uh, comics. Her one, her one uh, requirement, I remember as I got closer to adulthood, her one requirement was like, as long as you always have insurance, go ahead and, and do what you want, like health insurance. <laughs> but my dad, my dad was much more like, my dad was very practical minded. So he was like, you could do anything you want as long as it's doctor, lawyer, or engineer. <laughs> and, and we bet, we, we just butt heads all the time, especially when I was a teenager, you know? But now, you know, I'm in my 40s. I have my own kids. I, I get where he's coming from. He, he worked really hard to, to make it okay. in America, and he just didn't want me to screw it up, you know? I, I guess Eisner's parents, I think his mother was the more practical one, and his father was kind of the, the, the one with his head in the clouds, you know? But yeah, so yeah. that... That, that is, you know, I, I think that's kind of a lot of, especially in the graphic novels, but in the spirit too, there's kind of an every man, every person quality that Eisner's work has that people uh, can relate to. Uh, you mentioned uh, when we were talking the other day that To the Heart of the Storm uh, was a personal favorite, and it's actually one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah, I have it right here. Too. I have it right ah, here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now, what is, you know, what is it about that one um, that, that, that holds a special place in your heart. I mean, this is, I, I, I'm pretty sure this is the copy that I got when it first came out. It first came out when I was in high school. And uh, I remember reading about it in Comic Shop News. Remember that little newspaper that sure. they would give out at comic book stores? I think they well, still little, give out at comic book paper, stores. But it, it yeah. fit, like, the type was so small, they fit like 100 pages in those four pages. But, yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, but I read it religiously every week. That, that, was, that was my New York Times was Comic Shop uh -huh. News. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember reading about it and, um, and just like kind of anticipating it, like really looking forward to it. When it came out, um, uh, there was, it, it was like, you know, I was really interested in comics. The, the comic book shops around my house were great, but they were still pretty heavily into superhero comics. And, and maybe there'd be like some Archie and some, some funny animal stuff, but the vast majority of stuff in the, those stores were, were superhero comics. And there was something inside of me that was like, this medium can be something else. You can tell other kinds of stories with comics, right? And I remember reading about the, to the heart of the storm, uh, I was already reading the spirit, those, those spirit reprints and thinking, I want to see what happens here, you know? And I, and I read it and what impressed me was, um, I mean, there's several things that impressed me about it. First was, it really is a, a deeply personal story. You know, even though it's fictional, um, you can tell that it comes from a real person's experience. And then just the craft of the whole thing is, is pretty amazing. I mean, I don't think he uses... Uh, he does, just has these sequences where he doesn't really have traditional panel borders, right? Like, no, like right here, you know, yeah. right here, he doesn't have any real traditional panel borders, it, but your eye is never confused. And yeah. I remember reading it 
you know, as a teenager going, how did he, how did he do that? How is he <laughs> so deft at telling my eye where to go on that page? Yeah, no, that, 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 that's a real gift. And the thing he did purposely, you know, really uh, yeah. in the graphic novel, in the spirit too, but really in the graphic novels, um, uh, right, to, to guide your eye with the art and the lettering, you know, just, um, um, and, and what about, and the content matter? I know, I mean, it's, it's obviously very autobiographical. It's about his growing up in this immigrant yeah. home. Was that, was that uh, relatable? Yeah, to I mean, well? I, I think it's a, it's a classic coming of age story. It's about a young man who's like trying to figure out what he's going to do with his life. He's trying to figure out, um, you know, what his place in the world is during an incredibly, incredibly tumultuous time in the world, you know? And, and eventually, um, you know, I, I, think, I think the vast majority of my career was spent, has been spent in the, in the young adult space with those coming of age stories. Right. So I, right. I really do think that um, something about To the Heart of the Storm really did affect the way I thought of, about stories told in comics. That's very powerful. That's really, you know, I mean, yeah, that, that, it's, it's, in that, not, in that book, it feels to me like all the stuff he kind of, was figuring out in the previous yeah. books that came uh, to fruition in, in that yeah. in, in that graphic novel. Yeah, it just feels like a very very personal work, right? And when when we spoke the other day, and uh, I always hate it when people throw my quotes at me, but you <laughs> you said <laughs> that you were moved by how Eisner's work would regularly deal with the struggle between good and evil in a character's heart. That was a pretty profound yeah. statement. That, what, can you expand on that a little bit? So, you know, I, I've only read a fraction of, of the spirit, right? I read all, all the, I mean, I read all of the strips that were reprinted while I was in high school collecting those uh, kitchen sink reprints. Mm -hmm. But that's just a tiny fraction of what he did. I mean, he did so many spirit stories. My understanding, though, is that um, the spirit went through this progression. So I read some of the early stuff, but I think the stuff that was being reprinted when I was collecting uh, tended towards the later spirit. Um, so my understanding was that uh, early on, it read much more like a traditional superhero comic. And then as time went on, Eisner started to become more interested in the struggles of the everyman. So the spirit eventually became almost like an avatar in his own mm -hmm. comic, right? And, and the stars of every story were these average people who are trying to figure out their own lives. And, right. and I, think, um, I think you could tell that that's what Eisner was really interested in. Like he, he obviously loved the spirit, it was his own creation, but um, what he was really interested in is was these morality plays, like how the average human beings figure out what, what's good and, and what's evil. Um, I, and and I, think, uh, I think it was, it was that plus the combination of craft that, that really drew me to his work early on. Cool. Um, now, I know you're also a, a fan of Will's uh, textbooks. I know you mentioned especially uh, comics and sequential art. Yeah. And I know that you uh, do a good deal uh, of teaching. Um, can you talk a little about uh, how Eisner, those textbooks, uh, you know, informed your sensibility, both as a creator and as a, and as a teacher? I mean, when I, when I was in high school, I think comics and sequential art was really the only true um comics craft book at at my local library so it used to be like it's not like now now you walk into any library there's like this giant like graphic novel section which is amazing to see but i'm also a little bit jealous of all the kids growing up now when i was a kid if you wanted to like anything comic book related you had to wander into the nonfiction section and it was all under like 741 i think it was 0.9 right it was all the comics that were 0.8 <laughs> something like that Right, and, um, and, and comics and sequential art was the only one that was in the adult section. I think if you went to the juvenile section, like how to draw comics the Marvel way was there. But at, at my local library, that was it. And, yeah. um, and, and I, I also grew up reading how to draw comics the Marvel way, which I do love, you know? But I, I do think that that isn't necessarily geared towards talking about comics as a, as a medium it's really geared towards a specific genre. How do you tell like effective superhero comics and adventure comics? Whereas, mm -hmm. whereas uh, comics and sequential art was like way different. Like that wasn't, I just, I just don't think he was like concerned necessarily about doing adventure stories, right? He was like, how do we take this medium of still pictures put in sequence 
and tell really, really human stories. And, and he, he talked about, you know, um, bird's eye view versus worm's eye view. He talked about the lettering. You know, he talked about the acting that the character has to go through. Uh, and and uh, I, think, uh, I think the level of seriousness with which he took the, the, the medium of comics was very, it was very prescient. And it was also very rare at the time. I, don't, I just don't think anybody else was doing it. Maybe until Scott McCloud came around with mm -hmm. understanding comics. I, I, don't, I don't remember there being a real discussion, at least where, you know, in the suburbs where I was growing up, I don't remember there being a real discussion about <laughs> comics as a, a literary art. Right, well, not just a discussion, but also then putting it down in a book. In, yeah. You know, in, three, in three books, really, but, you know, it's certainly in yeah. that first comics and sequential art. Um, and I guess another, another parallel between your career uh, and, and Will's um, is that, you know, you know, he did stuff that was purely commercial and then stuff that was more fine art or more literary. And, and you as well seem to veer between you do stuff for um, uh, DC and, and other big companies, but then you also do stuff that's more personal. Um, how do you, you know, sort of in the context of Will, but I mean, how do you strike that balance and how, uh, if in any way, did Will inspire or inform that? Well, um, you know, um, I, I didn't find out until very recently that Will was the creator of the Freedom Fighters in DC Comics, you know? Uh, so it, it really, like, even in the superhero world, even though I don't, I don't think that's, like, outside of the spirit, I don't think that's what he's known for. But his, his fingerprints are still all over the DC universe, right? Uh, so it's, it's really interesting. Um, I, w one of the things that I do admire about, uh, uh, about Eisner is that... Um, he seemed like he could balance the, uh, the practical, like even though he had that struggle between the practical side and, and his cartooning early on, it seemed like even with his approach with, uh, in cartooning, he had the practical side. Like he was a businessman and he was a, he was a fair, he was a pretty good businessman, especially for a cartoonist. I think most of us suck. <laughs> you know, like, like I feel like I could barely pay my bills sometimes. And I feel like I'm really good at uh, numbers. I, I, I took AP calculus in high school, but for whatever <laughs> reason, anytime you put a, a, like a, like a dollar sign in front of the number, I have like some sort of weird emotional break and I have a hard time thinking about it, you know? Um, yeah. But I don't think, I don't think Will had that problem. I don't think Eisner had that problem. Right? I, don't, I think he was, he found a balance. He was able to run a successful business from beginning to end. And, and I think that's something that I, I deeply admire. Um, and I, I think it's something that I, I'm, I'm trying to strive for now is, is figuring oh, cool. that out, you know? And, and in terms of what you're talking about, like mainstream versus uh, more personal stories, um, yeah, I, I also think that, you know, I, I, I don't think he went through a period of, he, maybe, in the early, maybe early on in his career, you would probably know better than I do. Did he, did he ever go back and forth like within the same year where he's working on his own stuff and also working on stuff for DC Comics? Well, it, it wasn't so much for uh, DC. He would, you know, he had a lot of clients. So when he worked with Jerry Iger, they had a lot of clients in, the, in, in uh, overseas and in England and um, they were very good at learning how to syndicate stuff. Um, mm. You know, then he was he then he was doing the PS magazine and a lot of stuff for the military. He he almost always had a studio, so they were juggling a lot of things. So yeah. even when he was doing the Spirit, um, my impression is there were still like people in his studio yeah. under his supervision doing other stuff. So he always, although I think I think for him personally, the Spirit was such you know to put out a seven or eight page story of that quality every week and every meanwhile week. supervise the you know the lady luck and uh, mm -hmm. and um and, and jules pfeiffer strip um um the, the name i'm blanking on um you know it just was but i think they always had a lot of balls in the air and 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 um were constantly um busy you know with with things from instructional materials to the spirit, which of course, mm -hmm. even though it was, you know, quote unquote commercial, was still I think a labor of love and a very personal statement, just more, a little more disguised than the, you know, the directly autobiographical graphic novels. So I know, mm -hmm. I, I know you have to run, Let, let's just wrap up. And I just wanted any final thoughts on Will about his legacy, about his place in 
in the you know in comics and and the greater uh, literary uh, history. Well, you know, first of all, that that's right. Like when he created the Freedom Fighters, it wasn't for DC Comics. It was for another company right. that eventually got absorbed by DC Comics, right? So, I think so, so yeah, yeah. But I mean, I I think I think the fact that um, the uh, I mean, probably the most prestigious award in American comics is named after Will Eisner. It says something about his place in um, in the industry and in the art form. Uh, I, I, I think that even if you are not aware of it, like cartoonists who might not be aware of Eisner's influence are still influenced by Eisner. That's how, that's how ubiquitous I think his ideas are yeah, think and his right. techniques are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing. That, that was like, you know, coming up in comics, that was my dream was to, to get something with Eisner's name on it, right? To get that award with Eisner's name on it. <laughs> and I think that's true for all, all, all cartoonists coming up in America right now. That's how, that's how influential he was. It's true. Well, Gene, thank you so much for taking the time. I hope we get to do this again sometime in person where we yeah. actually do this face to face in front of other humans. Not that, not that you guys out there aren't humans, but you know <laughs> what I mean. in front yeah. of actual people in an audience. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for all the great work you do and, and stay well. Yeah, you too. You too, Danny. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you, Gene.